America Live. Brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's good to be back with you. And, you know, <clears throat> Tonight I was wondering what to talk about, like I always do. And there were two different subjects I thought we might approach. One was the opposite of virtue. And we say, well, why don't you say the opposite of vice? Well, because if I know the virtue, the problem in our lives is we don't know the vice. And most people are absolutely sure that what they were born with, they can't help. So they have no responsibility before God to change. Well, <clears throat> that's really not true. If I was a bricklayer, I would first uh, be obliged, and I have a right then, to learn how to lay brick. I would also have to know what do you what do you lay brick with. Oh, if I took that big trowel in my hand and I put some mortar on a brick, it would be everywhere but on the brick. I don't know how to do it. Doesn't mean I can't. Somebody has to teach me. And th that was the question that the eunuch asked Philip. Here's a eunuch. He was not. Uh, he was a pagan, but he, he, he heard and read about Yahweh, and so he had some scriptures, and and he was on his way home to serve the queen. He's reading, but he doesn't know what he's reading. Here comes Philip. You know, I always like that idea. You know, that just the Lord pulled him up by the hair, plunk, right in front of the carriage. He says, what are you doing? He says, I'm, I'm reading Isaiah. Do you know what you're reading? I said, no. I said, how am I going to know? Unless somebody teaches me. So all of us, if you have a hot temper, of course, I mean, nobody here would have a hot temper, you know? No. They all look so gentle this tonight. <laughs> Everybody looks very gentle tonight. So you would say, well, no, I have a moderate temper, or I have a temper like everybody else, or I'm not as hot-tempered as somebody else. You ever say that? Hmm? Well, that proves you don't know yourself. Did you ever get angry with somebody and that somebody, um, or somebody else comes to you and says, now what did you say that he saw her? And you say, maybe you said to him, I think you're nuts. But when you give an example to that person of how you said it, what you usually say is, well, I think you're nuts. But that isn't the way you said it. That, you, all, you ever have that experience? Yeah. Which means we don't know ourselves. It would be nice sometime put a little recorder in your kitchen 
not for anybody else's sake or that you're catching on, uh, kind of checking up on anybody, but it'll be interesting to see how you will reply to people. You can say, now, what do you want? Or you can say, what do you want? Mm, same words, but two different responses and two different actions. You'll say, what are you mad about? I'm not mad. What do you want? Oh, you can fool me. So sometimes it isn't even the words we say. It's how we say it. Now, if you're all nervous and upset about something, let me tell you, it's not going to come out right. If someone to say you and you're all upset about something totally foreign to the, to the event, and he says, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Didn't I marry you? <laughs> well, it's not bad to say that. It's how you said it. If you said it, yeah, I love you. That's why I married you. No, it's not different. So sometimes when you, you feel people just don't want to be around you, examine what you say and how. How? you say it. Kind of wait a minute before your mouth opens and you prove there's nothing in your head. <laughs> I mean, if there's nothing there, I would be silent. At least nobody knows it. <laughs> and if we have something to say, and I catch myself doing that. Like I say it to my mother, I say, watch. Mm -hmm. It's all nothing, nothing. Then I, I walk away and say, now why did they say nothing when they just said mother? Well, I examine, how did I say that? I would have ran away if I was in their shoes, see? What? What do you want? <sighs> now I could blame it on my Italian temperament. I could say I was born hot tempered. I would say they're out of sorts. But the truth is, it's me. Eh? And I'd like you to think about that a little bit. I'm going to show you from the scriptures what happened to the apostles. I want to make you feel good tonight. I don't want you to leave this place feeling like a, a nobody. I want you to feel tonight that you're in the same position with the same human nature as these apostles. <clears throat> this might show you what is wrong with you. If you have a Bible, I had a meditation for the sisters this morning during a class. I told them one time, when I was a young sister, a novice, that's ages ago. Every Friday at lesson, uh, Reverend Mother gave lesson, and every Friday, whoever came late had to give the meditation in the middle of the floor out loud. And I, when the bell rang, I would take my apron off, and I knew I had five minutes to get there. But every time I got there, Friday after Friday after Friday, I was late. Well, I'd be kneeling there because I was late, and Mother, Reverend Mother would walk in, and she'd look at me. She says, well, while you're there, give the meditation. <laughs> well, this happened four or five Fridays, you know, and I began to catch on. I thought, uh-huh. So I looked at the clock, and 10 of 9, I took my apron off, and I waited, sat on my chair. The bell rang, late. Everybody's walking in, and they see me, and they get pale in the face, you see, because they had concocted that if they rang the bell late, I'd be forced to make the meditation, you see, and they hated to make the meditation in public. And I'm sitting there smiling. 
Well, we had another custom. If at lesson you dropped something and made noise, you had to kneel down until Reverend Mother rapped on the table, you see. So I'm there, puffed up with my bright idea. I finally caught on. And by golly, my sisters went. I never quite figured out how I got out of my basket. So I knelt down, and Mother looks up, and she says, well, while you're there. <laughs> Well, I decided to make a Whopper meditation on the virtue of charity. Love and all these little things, all these good little things. And so from then on, nothing ever dropped from my basket and the, the, the bell was always on time. And I finally, after many years, began to laugh at it. However, it's not so good when we don't know ourselves and we don't like what the will of God is doing at the present moment. I'm having a mic problem, and the reason I am is because it's slipping off of my gimp, and they're going to come and fix it. So please don't go away if you want the rest of the story. <laughs> I'll be back in just a bit. I think I fixed it. back with that story. I hope you can hear me now. So when, when we, even if we're, we're close to the Lord and we're trying to be close to the Lord, don't forget we're human still. And sometimes we have a wonderful day when we really come up to par, we, we think we do. And then all of a sudden, boom, down you go. And this is with little things. We hope no one really knows taking in, in danger of very, very serious sin. And even then, people walk into it. See? But if we're faithful in little things, little occasions, then when something big comes along, we can come up to it and, 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 and grow in holiness. Now, I'm going to show you from this, this event in the fourth chapter of, of Mark. I'm not going to go too fast with it because you can't read scripture fast. You have to read it slow and stop every so often and think about what you're reading. I'm going to read this piece of scripture here very fast and tell you how so many people read it. Now, if you read it like a newspaper, you're going to do this. With the coming of the evening, the same day, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And the leaving the crowd behind, they took him just as he was. Hmm, I wonder how he was. Well, anyway, and there were other boats with him. Now, our curious mind will stop and say, I wonder how many boats. Then it began to blow a gale, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so it was almost swamped. They must have been scared to death. But he was in the stern, his head on the cushion asleep. Now, why didn't he wake up, for goodness sakes? <laughs> and he woke up and rebuked the wind. And they said to him, Master, do you not care? Well, they had every reason to be, to be scared. And he said, Quiet now, be calm. And the wind dropped. Well, it was about time, you know. <laughs> then he said to them, Why are you so frightened? Well, they had every reason to be frightened. They were drowning. How is it you have no faith? Now you could read scripture like that. Come out with a critical mind. The Lord didn't care. Why was he asleep when they were drowning? What was wrong with them? And you can go right out and you miss the entire point. 
the entire point. And this is why <coughs> I'd like to show you a little way of reading scripture by using your imagination and your memory. And slowly. Let's go back now. And, and we used to say in monastic life that you place yourself in the presence of God. Well, you can't help but being in the presence. What you want to do is remember you're in the presence of God. Wherever you go, if you go to the heavens or down in another world, God is there all the time. Now, it says here, with the coming of evening, that same day, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. It's a good place to stop for a minute and know the Lord had worked hard all day talking to the people, and even he felt he needed to rest. He needed to just go somewhere quiet and be, be with his friends relax. You know, for some of you, that's a real lesson. You haven't really relaxed for years. You work horses. You can't stop. Some of you are afraid to stop. You're afraid to catch up with yourself. You're afraid you have to think. You're afraid of your conscience, maybe. But even Jesus had to get away. And leaving the crowds behind, they took him just as he was in the boat. And there were other boats with him. And it's, it's nice to know that sometimes we have to leave the crowd. We have to leave all of those things in our mind. Sometimes it's not the crowd around us, it's the crowd up here. This is a lot of places. We got to leave all this stuff up here. Jesus was divine and human. He is the tireless one. As his divinity and his human nature, he was tired. Needed to get away. Well, let's see what happened. Then it began to blow a gale. In those areas, it happens very suddenly. And the waves were breaking into the boat, so it's almost swamped. Now, here's a good place to stop. You're in a boat, nice and calm when you start it up. All of a sudden, <laughs> wow. Wow, they started trying to get the water out of the boat. The boat starts going around this way. It's not going anywhere. More and more water is coming in. Yet you have to stop and picture that in your mind. And picture yourself in that boat. <sighs> but Jesus was in the stern, his head on a cushion asleep. Wow. Now, there's another place to stop and think. He was so tired in his human nature. The tireless God, divine and holy, becomes human for us, never losing his divinity, to become tired. He wanted to feel your fatigue. And sometimes, you know, Alabama is in a tornado alley, is, and if we have tornadoes, I think last Friday, we, I don't know, we had 10 or 12. And some of our sisters conk out, that is it. I mean, the whole monastery could be lifted up and placed a mile away. And they wake up the next morning and say, oh. <laughs> what happened? Well, our dear Lord was like that tonight. And this, this little passage is an awesome passage to read. And then, and St. Mark is the detail man. The others were not interested in the cushion. They woke him up. I can just see John or Peter saying to John, wake him up. And John say, no. He's tired. What do you mean, tired? We're drowning. 
but we'll drown with him. I don't buy that. Wake him up. <laughs> and John says, no. I can see Thomas saying, well, what's he going to do if we do wake him up? <laughs> Poor Thomas didn't grow that way, you know, on Good Friday. He was that way his whole life. And I could see Peter looking at Thomas and said, get the water out of here and shut up. <laughs> well, Peter can't take it anymore. Mark was very kind. He said, they woke him up. He didn't really want anybody to know who it was that woke him up. And he said, Master, do you not care? We're going down. Who would dare say that? Huh? Oh, well. Do you not care? Stop there for a minute. How many times have you said to God, you're not answering my prayers, you must not care. Oh, that's a terrible thing to say. I'm going to tell you now what Jesus answered him. They said two things, Master, do you not care? And the other things were going down. Well, let me tell you something about those two questions. The first question said, was very unloving. You have somebody that you love or loves you, don't you care? That is a very heart hurry doubt. The next thing, they informed him that they did not believe he was son of God because he says here, we're going down as if he didn't know. His humanity was asleep. His divinity never slept or sleeps. Haven't we done that? Lord, I'm going down. Why aren't you helping me? Why don't you love me? How many people, good people that are keeping the commandments and doing and praying well, get a, a, a long siege of dryness, a long siege when prayer is difficult, you don't feel like prayer, you don't want to read anything spiritual. That's when we say, why do why is this? We don't understand the ways of God, that He has to do that to us. He has to give us those opportunities to prove we love him in difficulties, in tragedies, in heartaches. Well, he woke up, he rebuked the wind, which answered their first question, do you not care? And we're going down. And he said to the sea, be quiet. Be calm. There's a raging wind, an enormous amount of rain and waves. He wakes up. Now, if I were God, and thank God I'm not, <laughs> In that position, I would have, I would have woke up with one eye at a time. I looked around, and then I would have slowly opened the other one, just to make the miserable thing. <laughs> <coughs> but God didn't do that. I'm running out of water in case somebody wants to know. <laughs> I can see my sisters up there, get a water, get a water. <laughs> now we have to look at what did Jesus say to them? I mean, how did he answer their question? Do you not care? Well, he said to them, why are you so frightened? 
Oh, you better stop there a long time if you're going to read this passage. Why? Because we are all frightened about something. The future. In today's world, we're frightened with something we've never thought in a million years we'd be frightened about. Birth and death. Somebody else may decide for us whether we live or die. We're too old. We're in the way. We have no quality of life. We're going to air on this network a program, a half hour, on partial birth abortion. Look at it. And tell me how we can justify murder a few seconds before birth of a normal human being. Tell me that. How can we do that? In this country, we have one bend of mind. Kill the young and the unborn, abuse the children, murder by assisted suicide the elderly or the sick, and kill off everybody else. So tell me how you can think that way. And the rest of the people are frightened. Others decide and play God. The question is here in this place, in this passage. He said to the wind, quiet and be calm. That was easy for him. And then he said, why are you frightened? Did they really believe he was God? Did they think for a moment that the Lord Messiah waited for hundreds and thousands of years? Was going to drown with them or let them drown? Would they did not know the scriptures that said he would become a worm and no man, denied by one of his own and mocked by his own priests and those in the temple? Well, apparently they didn't. Most of us feel here a kind of injustice. You have a right to be scared if water's coming in a boat. You can't get anywhere. You can't get it out of the boat on a human level. We all feel sure they had a right to be frightened. And he said, no. We have no right to be frightened. Our comfort and our confidence is in the Lord. No matter what happens to us, we cannot be frightened by anything or anybody. If we believe Jesus is Lord and God and Son of God, we have no right to be afraid. Well, and he said something else. They gave him two questions. He gave them two answers in question form. How is it that you have no faith? He didn't, he didn't reprimand them for having a little faith. How is it you have such little faith? We would have probably thought that was proper and just. He wanted to know why they had no faith. I wonder if he wouldn't say that to some of us. How is it you have no faith? God has been good to all of us. You say, well, I don't know. I've had problems from when I was born. I'm a born loser, everything. I trudge turns to ashes if you've done your best and it falls apart, God is with you. 
If you try to be better, you try to be holy, you try to be saintly, and you seem to mess it eyes with you, he will forgive you. He, you can make it, you can come back. Some of you teenagers have done some pretty bad things. No one will tell you, but you need to know they're pretty bad things. They're everlasting things that may turn against you. You must stop now. Why are you so frightened? How is it? How is it in this day and age that so many Catholics and priests and religious have lost faith in the Eucharist? Many bishops write about the Eucharist, the real presence of Jesus. I got a letter, for a little note, for a phone call really, it wasn't a note, but it's written in note form. So the visiting priest at this particular church told a congregation of 60 people that you, Mother Angelica, denied the real presence on your live show. He either has wax in his ears or an overworked imagination. I have dedicated my life to the Eucharist. My life, my work, my death, whatever it is, I give to the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. I feel sorry. For all of you, lay or religious or bishops or priests, who go through the motions, but don't believe. Because he is our food in this life. Our God did an awful lot coming down in human form when he was so powerful. He knew all that was coming. He knew one day there would be automobiles and airplanes, but he walked like they all walk. He knew all the things today and all the things to come. But he lived in his time and suffered from the hate, from everything that you and I have wrong with us except sin. And then he humbles himself in another way that if we had even thought of it, it would be blasphemous, that God would come in real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and be our food. Who would think of that? And he said, unless you receive that, you do not have life in you. I saw a mass on our own television network the other day. Big wing ding. Celebration. All the precious blood was in wine glasses. <clears throat> People were coming up like they were taking a Coca-Cola clunk. <sighs> it's amazing to me, you know. We give God the very least we build his temples now that look like garages. And we have the best. People ride in big cars and have big houses and some of the best of food. The Lord has a little glass, a common table glass. His house is very small, very empty, very cold. I have our time with it. And you know I do. I keep telling you, fight for the Lord with your faith. I was reading this to the sisters this morning who we were going over this meditation and I thought to myself, I wonder, Lord, you could rightfully say today to each one of us, how is it? You have no faith in my presence, in my power, in my love for you, in my desire for you to come to my kingdom, 
in my desire for you to raise, be raised up by my spirit, by grace, to a high degree of holiness. How is it you don't care? I think if we were in my place today, tonight, he would say that to you. And to me, to me. Well, read this sometime. It's chapter 4, 35 to 41. After this, the apostles ask another question. Can you beat it? What was their last question? Was it saying, Lord, I'm sorry, I have no faith? Or, Lord, give me faith. They said, who can this be? Even the wind and the sea obey him. They had their problems, like you and I. So, before you read a lot of scripture all at one time, ask yourself some questions. I know a lot of people think I have a lot of faith. Let me give me an old, let me give you an old definition of faith. I've, I've been saying this for years. Faith to me is one foot in the ground, one foot in the air, that queasy feeling in your stomach. Why? God asks us to do many things. He doesn't ask us to like it. He doesn't mind if we're afraid. And he doesn't mind if it's hard. All of this had to be hard for him. And even after this event, when the apostles still, after the miracle of calming the sea and the wind, they ask, who is this man? Instead of saying, this truly is a son of God. He didn't leave him alone. He didn't say, look, you guys are crazy and you don't have any brains. No. He looked at him lovingly and kept at him day after day, day after day. Even when Peter denied him, he did not take his call away. I say to you that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. What a God we have. We should never be frightened. Never be afraid. He loves us. And we have a call. Hello? Hello? Where are you from? Fort Wayne. And what is your question? What is a virtue? What is what? A virtue. A virtue. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. A virtue is an occasion when I have to make a choice between doing something to please God or something to please the Lord, or something to please the world or me. The apostle did not at this point show any virtue. Virtue would have been to be in deep faith at this time. They saw him perform miracle after miracle. They saw him deliver men from demons and raise, oh dear, gave strength to people who couldn't walk, couldn't hear, couldn't see, gave them eyes and new ears. And, but they said, who is this man? Now faith is a virtue, or it's what we call a theological virtue because it comes directly from God faith, hope, and love, and you get all of these at baptism. Don't make your children wait till they're 10 years old to be baptized. I think there ought to be a priest right after the baby is born and dunk him. <laughs> Before you wipe him, dunk him. <laughs> because that's what an awesome thing is baptism. Now that's theological, what we mean. It comes directly from God and that has to be given to us at baptism. Now, at a time when faith could have been, these, these men were baptized by John, not by Jesus yet. So they have an excuse, but they were men of scripture. They didn't have much excuse. 
Now, I can, when I exercise faith that God has given me, then it is a virtue. That I have to believe even when it's hard to believe. Anybody living in the world today, you have questions and doubts even from the altar, from, see, from catechism class, your children in, in school. They come home and say, oh, that's just a symbol. Now your faith has to act strong. I said, no, it isn't. It's the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. Father or sister said, I can love somebody and, and have an affair because I love them. No, it's not true. That's virtue, to say the truth. And they must have thought of this after the resurrection and they had the Holy Spirit. They realized they didn't really believe that this was Son of God. Because they said, who is this that commands the wind and the waves? And virtue takes another turn. If I have faith, hope, and love from Jesus at baptism, those virtues, those theological virtues that come from God have to spread out to my neighbor, to me, in every moment of my life. When we have a tragedy, when our prayers aren't answered, when you get cancer, and all these things we get, when your children leave the faith, we have to have that faith that says, Lord, I love them and you love them. I will pray for them. I will love them. There is a belief God will take care. Another virtue of faith is that no matter who tries to, to ruin your faith or d disturb your faith, that happens all the time. Today it does. Like the poor woman I told you about a couple of weeks ago, she wanted to go to confession so bad. She's dying. And the priest came in, he's walking up and down, he didn't want to hear her confession. Finally, everything she said, that's nothing, that's nothing, that's nothing. But she said it all. She wrote me a letter and she said, he said, I wasted my time. But she said, I know. I told him the truth. I told him my sins. He said, well, I absolved. And I said, yes, yes. She died a few days ago. She had faith. That was a time to say, the Lord said, if I confess my sins to a priest, and he absolves me, even if that man was unloving, uncaring, and rude, <laughs> she was forgiven. She knows that. That's a virtue, which means if I feel angry, I don't act angry. I think I want to be like Jesus. I want to be gentle, and I am gentle then. You say, well, that's hypocrisy. No. Why? My motivation is not human respect. My motivation is I want to be like Jesus. St. Francis de Sales had a hot temper. He controlled it so well that he was known as the gentlest of saints. But one day when he was a bishop, some young priest came in and laid him flat for something he didn't like he did. And St. Francis did nothing. The man stomped out. So the secretary of the bishop, Francis de Sales, said, why, why did you lay him out? He said, well, I thought about it. And then I thought, why should I lose in one minute what I have worked 20 years to get? Ooh, that was virtue. Some boy asks you for a date and asks you to have an affair, and you say no. That's virtue. Somebody wants you to go out on some kind of drunken, dope, drug party, and you say no. That's virtue. When your dad or mother asks you not to do something or to do something that's better than you want to do and you say, okay, that's virtue. When you're jealous of somebody's talent and you say to them, 
or you feel like saying, well, I'm as good as you are, why don't I have that talent? You don't. Instead, you say, thank you, Lord, that you have given that person that talent. All of that is virtue. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother. Where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. And what is your question? All right. Uh, it's about purgatory. Um, a little purgatory? Yes. My favorite subject. I know. Um, I love you, and I watch your show all the time, and yeah. I've written to you, and you've written back. And <clears throat> a couple of times, I, I have AIDS, and uh, my husband just passed away, and I have a son. And uh, what I want to know was, you, you had said about purgatory is like a cleansing because nobody can get into heaven unless, uh, you know, their soul is clean, cleansed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know, I, I read a lot of novenas and stuff, and I have a, uh, a medal that somebody gave me a uh, priest that visited me in the hospital one day, and it's a uh, sacred. It says the uh, apostleship of prayer. Uh, oh gosh, I can't read it. It's sacred from the Sacred Heart, and on mm-hmm. the back it says, "Seize the heart of Jesus is with me. Right. Thy kingdom come." And underneath it says, "100 days each time." Mm-hmm. Now. Can you explain that what planetary indulge, mm-hmm. um, indulgences are? Right. Is that like yeah. indulgences really had a kind of bad rap? Is that a good way to say it? You know, I I, I think they've been so misunderstood by so many people. The church has a tremendous amount of graces that given to it by the Spirit of indulgences, meaning. Um, the ability to give uh, an indulgence means if I paid your debts. Let's put a look at it that way. If a person's in purgatory and we say for them a Hail Mary, a rosary, or some highly indulgence prayers, what does that mean? The church has the power by God to remit some of that po- some of that pain. If a doctor has great power, what can he do? He can heal you, but at first, before you're totally healed, he will give you medicine, he'll maybe operate on you. He takes away from you. In a matter of maybe of hours through an operation or days or months through medication, this evil thing or this bad thing in your body well, we, it's, it's a bad example, but that's all I could think of. The church has the same power. It has the power of if there's someone in purgatory, they want God so much. They know what they've done. They admit what they've done, and they're happy to get all that rust off of them because they have seen Jesus. The only thing they want is to be with him now, unlike how they acted on earth. Now, the church has the power to take away from that that days, those years or months or maybe hours of cleansing by allowing the cleansing to act more quickly. The time then is shortened. If you had a tumor and the tumor caused you a lot of pain and the doctor operated on you, you lessen the pain from the time you recuperate, and sometimes you never have it again. That's a bad example, but it shows what an indulgence does for the soul. If you have AIDS, I thought that's what she said, or he said, you know your time is limited. What a beautiful time now to become holy. See, how you got that AIDS, I don't want to know. You may have got it by some accident, whatever, by a transfusion. But if you accept it with joy, you 
say, Lord, forgive me all my sins. I forgive the person who gave me this by this transfusion. I want to be with you. And go over your sins and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Go to confession. Read good books. Read spiritual books. Change your mind, your heart, your soul. You can become a great saint. Those of you that have cancer, those of you who have terminal disease, don't waste it, don't waste it. The world wants to get rid of you. You're no longer valuable. That's the lie. Your faith has to say, yes, I am valuable. I'm crippled. I'm sick. I have cancer. I have a terminal disease. But I am valuable to God, more valuable now than I would have ever been in my whole life. That's faith. Be a great saint now. Don't let the world who got you into this situation destroy your spirit or destroy your heart. No. You have an opportunity to be holy, even to do away with purgatory by having a heart that is not so much concerned with purgatory or its, its cleansing fires, but only because you have disappointed or offended our Lord. We call that a pure act of love. Powerful, because the church has within her treasures the power to put you smack into heaven without purgatory. We have an awesome God, a generous God, a holy God, a loving God a redeeming God. Well, he's on your side. You choose to be on his side. And take advantage. Let us all repent of all our sins. And if you find it hard, go before the Blessed Sacrament. He is our life in this world of tears. I understand the government wants to send millions of dollars to poor countries for more abortions. Let us all tonight pray for this wonderful country that God gave us that we're destroying by the day. And pray for poor souls in purgatory for priests, religious, for those who've lost the treasure of treasures, our faith. Be willing to be mocked, to be persecuted, to be laughed at, or call names because you're faithful. Your reward in heaven will be great. I love you. And say often, thank you, Lord, for caring.